Okay, welcome everybody. Um, hello and welcome to the George Washington University English Department's annual Shakespeare lecture. My name is Mariah Frawley and I'm the English Department Chair here at GW. Before I make any introductory remarks, I want to extend a massive and heartfelt thanks to Emily McLeod and Emily Lathrop, two fabulous GWU English Department graduate students who have overseen this event from its conception and have done a phenomenal job planning. Thank you, um, really. <laughs> Thank you, Emily and Emily, from all of us here today. While we are presenting our event this year in a virtual format, we want to acknowledge the land upon which GWU stands, the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Piscataway and Anacostan peoples, who have served as stewards of this region for generations. We also want to affirm, as we did this past summer when planning for this event began, our department's commitment to racial justice. We unequivocally condemn white supremacy and police brutality, and we believe that Black Lives Matter. We carry these commitments with us in all that we do. Thank you to all who have joined us today. It means a great deal to the English department to share our good work with a wide audience. I extend a special welcome to our students and especially to students just joining us, whether as undergrads or graduate students this year. Welcome. And we can't wait to see you in person, hopefully next semester. Um, I would like to now hand things over to Emily McLeod and Emily Lathrop, co-organizers of this event, who will introduce our speakers and make some brief announcements. Thank you. Thank you, Mariah. Wonderful. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Emily Lathrop. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a PhD candidate in English here at GWU. We're so excited to get underway this afternoon. But before we do, a couple of quick announcements. There are live captions available through the TypeWell service, and we will put a link in the chat right now. It should already be there as well. In case you want to turn those on, you can also find the link in the comments on the Facebook live stream if you're watching on Facebook. We anticipate the program running around 90 minutes. Uh, our speakers will deliver their papers roughly around 20 minutes each, uh, followed by a brief discussion and audience questions. If you are watching on Zoom, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom to ask a question anytime. If you're watching on Facebook, feel free to put questions in the comments or the chat. You can also tweet at GW English using the hashtag ShakeRace and GW Annual Shakes, and I'll put those in the Zoom chat and in the Facebook chat shortly. Uh, now my colleague Emily McLeod will introduce our wonderful speakers. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, hi. My name is Emily McLeod. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm also a PhD candidate in English at GW. It is my pleasure to be introducing our speakers this afternoon. First, we will hear from Dr. Ambarin Dadaboy. Dr. Dadaboy is an assistant professor of literature at Harvey Mudd College in California. Her teaching and research focus on early modern English literature specifically drama and representation of race and religion on the English stage. And her paper today is titled, Something's Rotten in Kashmir, Postcolonial Ambivalence and the War on Terror in Vishal Bardwaj's Heather. Then we will hear from Dr. Joyce Green McDonald, who is Associate Professor of English at University of Kentucky, where she teaches courses on Shakespeare and Renaissance drama. She's the author of Women and Race in Early Modern Texts, and her new monograph is Shakespearean Adaptation, Race, and Memory in the New World, which has just been published. Her paper today is titled Dark Ladies, Black Women, Animating Lucy Negro, and Caroline Randall Williams, Lucy Negro Redux. We are delighted to welcome these illustrious scholars virtually to our GW community. And so, without any further ado, Dr. Ambarine Dadavoy.
I was muted. Uh, thank you, Emily and Emily for your kind invitation. Thank you, GW, for having me here. And um, I can't tell you how, what an honor it is for me to be speaking alongside one of uh, my scholarly idols, Joyce Green McDonald. Her work has been <laughs> an incredible influence on, on mine. And so um, this really is an honor for me. And I would also just like, uh, to acknowledge where I'm speaking to you from. I'm in Pomona, California, and these are the lands of the uh, Tongva people. They are a sovereign people uh, and they are still here. And I just want to acknowledge where I am from, particularly with this paper, because this paper is also about uh, a land that is occupied and a geography um, that remains colonized um, by settler colonialism and that has been exacerbated in particularly this last year. So I have my paper in front of me. Hopefully we'll have no technical difficulties and I'll just get started. I just want to preface these remarks on uh, Kashmir and Heather with um, a speech that a faculty member in India uh, Nivedita Menon gave uh, last year where she was speaking about the illegal occupation of Kashmir and she said everyone knows that India is illegally occupying Kashmir. It is said all over the world. Everybody accepts it, right? So the fact that we know this and yet we still go on. Um, so something's rotten in Kashmir. Heather, the final installment of Vishal Bhardwaj's Indian Shakespeare trilogy, reconfigures Hamlet in the context of Indian-occupied Kashmir. Released in 2014, the film depicts the events of the mid-1990s Kashmiri Muslim insurgency against the occupation and its agents, the Indian Armed Forces. Drawing on the turmoil of the nativist insurgency, and the an Indian government counter sponsored or the Indian government sponsored counter insurgency, which literally turned brother against brother, Bhardwaj's pivot to, to Hamlet is hardly surprising. At its most basic distillation, Shakespeare's play is a family romance of jealousy, frustration, betrayal, and unlicensed desire against which the affairs of state always lurking in the background seem little more than an irritating nuisance. Hardwaj nimbly yokes the two dueling plots of Hamlet in his Heather via the temporal and geographical registers he mobilizes for his adaptation. The contested and explosive locus of Kashmir enmeshes the personal with the political and the political with the personal to such an extreme that their discrete threads become indistinguishable. The violence and clandestine machinations of the political sphere bleed into, distort, and inform the intimacy of the domestic and familial. The constant state of war in Kashmir, then, is simultaneously without and within, with no escape possible. As the eponymous head their signals, Pura Kashmir Eked Khanahe, all of Kashmir is a prison. Hardwaj's film is further complicated, I argue here, by its ambivalent participation in war on terror culture, which demands a certain pathologically violent depiction of Muslim identity and in which the film eagerly and easily traffics. While extreme violence appears to be common currency on all sides of the depicted conflict, what the global war on terror has successfully communicated is that violence can be easily grafted onto Muslim identity, thereby, thereby anticipating and justifying the extrajudicial violence deployed against Muslims. In this paper, I explore how Heather interrogates national identity politics, agency, and personal and political freedom within political, familial, and patriarchal geographies that are simultaneously under assault and being renegotiated by the military and cultural dominance of the oppressor, the Indian nation state. As an adaptation of Shakespeare's Hamlet, the narrative in Heather treads familiar ground, the untimely disappearance of the father recalling the son home to find that his family is sundered, not only by the possible demise of the patriarch, but also the insertion of his uncle into that domain. These recognizable familial ruins function as the foundation upon which Pardwaj builds and deviates from his source. While there are the requisite analogs to many of the characters, Arsha as Ophelia, Ghazala as Gertrude, uh, Kuram as 
Claudius, Liaka the Zlecki, on and on and on. Uh, and of course, the ingenious comic construction of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern in the Salmans. The unfolding of the plot and the construction of our tragic protagonist deviate considerably from the source. Unlike in Hamlet, where the ghost's appearance frames the action of the first scene and establishes the telos of revenge generically mandated by the play, Bardwaj delays, Hamlet-like, in introducing not only this theme, but also its harbinger, the spirit named Ruhdar. This delay allows the audience to know Heather outside of the context of the revenge demanded by the command of the dead father, to see him struggle with his grief and pain, and to marshal these emotions into action and find answers to his father's disappeared status. Heather here becomes a man of action and resolve, one who challenges the violence of the state, not by matching that violence, but through modes of political protest and resistance. After the appearance of Ruhdar, whose reliability for Heather lies in his ability to confirm through poetry his relationship to Hilal Mir, Heather's disappeared father, and who provides confirmation of Hilal Mir's murder by the Indian Armed Forces, the narrative swiftly realigns with its source, with Heather falling into an antic disposition, confronting his uncle father in the mousetrap, and increasing the body count, culminating in the spectacularly explosive finale from which, in another deviation from the source, Heather is able to walk away. Sorry for all the spoilers if you haven't seen this movie. Um, it behooves anyone who writes about Heather, I think, to offer pertinent historical context for the film's geographical ambit. Emerging from the trauma of partition, which forcefully rent the subcontinent into two nation states, Indian occupied Kashmir continues to remain a casualty of that political and geographic wound. Its own promise of azadi, freedom, and identity dependent upon the whims of its more powerful would-be claimants and occupiers, Pakistan and India respectively. Kashmir is a remnant and a reminder of the failure of British imperial powers to morally and ethically divest themselves of the jewel in their imperial crown. Within the post-colonial reality and history of the subcontinent, Kashmir remains a colonized and occupied geography, its post-coloniality deferred. Bardwaj chooses a particularly tense period in, recent, in the recent history of Kashmir in which to locate Heather, the uprisings of the mid-1990s, which were inaugurated by armed demands for freedom in 1989. As Ananya Kabir signals in Territory of Desire, the 1989 clash resulted in the paranoid and suffocating security state that Bardwaj represents. And this is a long quote that I'm not going to read in its entirety, but you should have access to it somewhere. So I'm just going to read parts of it. Um, the, Kashmiri Azad, the Kashmiri demand for Azadi was made through Kalashnikovs, grenades and bombs, kidnappings, mass demonstrations, and other materializations of revolutionary violence. The Indian state, the Indian nation state swiftly rolled out its own apparatus of discipline and punishment in Jammu and Kashmir. And Jammu and Kashmir soon acquired the dubious distinction of becoming the world's most heavily militarized zone. Everyday reality was altered through crackdowns, bunkers, militants, su uh, surrendered militants, and a whole gamut of military and paramilitary regimes. I'm skipping a few lines, disappeared youth, raped women, intracommunal breakdown, interrupted childhood, traumatized soldiers, and above all, the thickness of rumor turned the region into a veritable space of death. Heather adroitly inhabits the Kashmir of Kabir's summary and its psychosocial aftermath, beginning not with the cause of the militarization, but exposing its subsequent conspiracy-driven claustrophobia and terror. Indeed, the expository scenes of the, films, uh, of the first few minutes of the film suggest the pervasive danger of the locale through tight shots of Hilal Mir walking through narrow alleyways followed by a group of armed militants, with, which then open to a wide shot of the compound he enters that has similarly armed militants manning the gates and patrolling the roof. Unlike many of its Hindi film predecessors, Heather subordinates the geographic splendor of the Kashmiri landscape to the military and political disaster endured by the local native inhabitants of the land. 
It is precisely this restricted focus on the political that allows the film to elicit sympathy for the people caught up in the judicial and extrajudicial violence, and paradoxically, to locate that violence in Muslim identity. Islam, violence, militants, and jihad are, often, are terms often associated in intimate proximity, especially in the age of terror and terrorism instantiated by the United States War on Terror in the wake of September 11, 2001. I recognize that marshalling an argument about the operations of the global war on terror in Heather will raise a few eyebrows as well as objections. Two that I anticipate are that the film depicts the events of Kashmiri militant insurgencies of the mid 1990s prior to the terrorist attacks in the US. Uh, prior to these attacks, which culminated in the US, the US's ongoing endless and geographically unbound, yet predominantly Islamicate war on terror. And the second is that utilizing US ideologies of war in a vastly different geography with its own particular history of conflict and violence erases the local valences of that conflict by bulldozing over it with yet another form of American exceptionalism. I don't here mean to attempt a, or claim a seamless genealogy for the war on, for war on terror culture um, that representations, um, let me start over again. I don't attempt to claim a seamless genealogy of war on terror culture and representation that sutures Heather to other media like 24, Homeland or American Sniper. However, I do argue that, localize, that the localizing of the Kashmiri struggle for independence and the ensuing violence in Muslim bodies suggests a pathology that all such media access to otherize and to de delegitimize their resistance to occupation and oppression. In other words, the real political and social injustices that motivate violence never have to be addressed so long as the fact of unlicensed non-state violence can be demonstrated, amplified, and responded to in equal or greater measure. I've used the term war on terror culture a few times, and I borrow it from scholar Mustafa Bayoumi, who writes, and again, this is in the American context, that this culture circumscribes the possibility of Muslim identity by always and only allowing it legibility in the context of the war on terror and violent extremism. And this is the second long quote, which I'm not gonna, read fully, uh, but you have it in front of you. I'll just read the first few lines. War on terror culture assumes that Muslims collectively are responsible for and sympathetic to all acts of violence by individual Muslims everywhere, unless and until they explicitly say otherwise. But even then, their words are often doubted since Muslims are seen as doctrinally prone to lying and violence. War on terror culture represents Muslims always and only through the war on terror lens and never on their own terms. War on terror culture promotes the seductive synergy of militarism and entertainment while rationalizing or ignoring the massive civilian death toll of the war on terror. Rather than naively applying Bayoumi's formulation to the Indian context, I would suggest looking for affinities, particularly given the evolving nature and over-militarization of the Indian occupation of Kashmir, and to the charge, both real and sometimes politically expedient, that non-Kashmiri actors have infiltrated the geography to form a global or pan-Islamic alliance or jihad. Whether we call it global counterterrorism or war on terror culture, India, like the US, has found it politic to frame the discourse around Kashmir through the optics of terrorism. Quote, India uses counterterrorism as the foundation for bilateral collaboration, including military to military ties, which would otherwise be controversial. India offered the US bases, airfields, and intelligence for the anti-Taliban campaign in Afghanistan, end quote. Just as we see geopolitical actions and discourses reflected in popular culture in the, in the US, India too has a long history, especially in film, of depicting the Kashmir conflict and the terrorist jihadist, with terrorists and jihadist Muslims at its center in films such as Roja, Locke, Kargil, and Mission Kashmir. 
to be sure, Heather is sympathetic to the flight of the Kashmiri or to the plight of the Kashmiri people and is not coy about portraying the violence of the Indian state in its efforts to quell independence movements and annihilate militant violence. The crackdown at the beginning of the film that we later learn was designed to catch Hilal Mir for performing an appendectomy on a militant and that subsequent firebombing of the Mir home disclosed the utter helplessness of the occupied populace in the face of military force and the power of the occupier. The discourse that justifies the occupation founders against the humanistic reasons that Hilal Mir offers for helping the militant when his wife, Ghazala, asks, Kis tarafab? What side are you on? And he responds, Zindagiki, of life or humanity. The film further emphasizes the asymmetry of power inherent in the position of the Kashmiris under Indian occupation through its depiction of the enhanced interrogation techniques deployed by the Indian Armed Forces in their detention center, Mama 2. I deliberately use the phrase enhanced interrogation, not only because it is relevant, because it is a revenant of the Bush administration's policies regarding the treatment of perceived terrorists in custody, and therefore an artifact from the US war on terror, but also because Brigadier T.S. Murthy, in answer to Arsha's questioning about torture, during his press conference in the film claims, quote, the Indian army is one of the most disciplined armed forces in the world. We train our officers to interrogate, not torture, end quote. His riposte is quickly revealed to be a semantic fiction when juxtaposed with the graphic sights and sounds of torture being inflicted on the prisoners in Mama Tu, which includes beatings, disfigurement, and genital mutilation. Like the clever wordplay that links U.S. and Indian torture to the global war on terror, these scenes have their analog in the leaked photos of U.S. troops torturing prisoners in the Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq. Uh, and this is the other long quote, and I just want to offer a, a warning that these are, these are descriptions of very graphic uh, actions taken by U.S. troops against their um, war prisoners. And I'll just read a few. The following list has some of these abuses, um, and I'll, I'll just read a couple from the beginning. Punching, slapping, kicking detainees, videotaping and photographing naked male and female detainees, um, forcing naked male detainees to wear women's underwear, uh, writing I'm a rapist on the leg of a detainee accused of rape, um, a male MP guard having sex with a female detainee. This one is particularly interesting to me because um, a male U.S. guard having sex with a female detainee strikes me as rape, but that it's not called rape in the sources that we have here. Uh, the idiom of the war on terror utilized by Bardwaj suggests a provocation not usually registered in war on terror culture, which purports that Muslims have deserved the violence and degradation visited upon them nor registered in mainstream Hindi cinema enga cinematic engagement with the Kashmir issue. Nonetheless, at the end, before the credits roll, Bhardwaj inserts an epilogue screen card which salutes and valorizes the Indian army for their efforts in Kashmir during the recent floods. Such maneuvers, slight and small as they might seem, when coupled with the retreat of the occupying forces from the narrative after the appearance of Ruhdar, signal the narrative's ambivalent relation not only to the occupation, but also to the war on terror culture in which it participates. Within this narrative of religious violence, extremism, the security state, and the post-colonial not state of Kashmir and Heather, what role do we allocate William Shakespeare's Hamlet? What authoritative, hegemonic, or subversive position might the playwright and play serve in the context that Bardwaj presents? As I've been trying to establish in Heather, Kashmir, its geopolitics, the psychosocial anxieties it generates and fosters, leave scant room for the revenge and ruminations mandated by its source. Indeed, the deferral of the Hamlet narrative in the first half of the film, seemingly of a piece with Hamlet's own delay in following the ghost's murderous mandates, suggests that the place of and for Shakespeare here is as a supplement. The spectral frame of Shakespeare facilitates the interrogation of Indian state politics and their brutal occupation of Kashmir. Of particular use to Bardwaj is Hamlet's most famous soliloquy, to be or not to be, which becomes a recurring motif 
through which the film investigates the arrested and unsatisfactorily static political position of Kashmir and the identity of Kashmiris, appearing in its most substantive form in Heather's antic monologue after he's learned about his uncle's hand in disappearing his father, in disappearing his father, his father's death after being detained in Mama Tu, and his mother's complicity in his father's downfall. This monologue takes place in Srinagar's Lal Chowk, or Red Square, an important geography in the Kashmiri resistance. Here, the newly shorn Heather dressed as a kind of harlequin within a threadbare blazer over a skurta and a boombox strapped to his body and a noose around his neck, provocatively asks, Ham he ya ham nahi? Ham he to kaha or nahi to kaha uh, And then I, I won't read the rest in Hindi and I'll just move to the English. Do we exist or do we not? If we exist, then where do we exist? If not, then where did we go? If we exist, then for what purpose? If we disappeared, then when? Did, did we exist? or did we not? Chutzpah happened to us. Um, and Heather mispronounces chutzpah as chutzpah, which is punning on an obscenity in Hindi. But he defines chutzpah as besharam gustach, jesse afspa, shameless insolence, like afspa. Uh, and afspa is the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, kind of like the Patriot Patriot Act here, which essentially grants the Indian military unlimited power to maintain public order in disturbed areas. The unchecked power of this act allows the military to disappear, maim, and kill anyone they deem to be dangerous. Unlike Hamlet's meditation on what follows after we have shuffled off this mortal coil, Heather's catechism slips from the personal to the political, transmitting the state of uncertainty that the state of emergency in Kashmir has fomented. Shakespeare's language offers a utility insofar as his poetic idiom encodes Heather's resistance within a recognizable schema. The existential problem with which Hamlet wrestles subtends Heather's speech, yet that problem is about the dislocation and erasure of Kashmir and Kashmiri identity. The other allusion to Hamlet's famous soliloquy, however, seems to disrupt the film's initial deployment within the network of its political imaginary by locating it firmly in Heather's own personal turmoil about who and what to believe. Heather's faith in the veracity of Ruhdar's words and his ventriloquized paternal command to murder Kuram for his betrayal is vexed by Kuram's own revelations about Ruhdar's status as an undercover Pakistani intelligence officer. Torn between his many and replicating father figures, the wronged poet father, the vengeful ghost father, the incestuous uncle father, and the incestuous uncle father, Heather struggles to untangle the complex web of lies, deceit, and political intrigue in which he is ruthlessly enmeshed. In the comforting arms of his lover, Arsha, Heather contemplates the truths and lies he's being surprised, or that he's being prescribed. Uh, and I'll just read this, um, I'll just read the translation that I have here. Um, if suspicion is taken as truth, then truth is also suspicious to me. And then he continues to deploy antithesis until he gets to his final question. Uh, and this I'll read it in Hindi. Kiska jud hai, kiska sach me sach nahi, hai ke hai nahi, bas, yehi sawal hai. And in English, that's whose lie is a lie and whose truth is true. Is it or is it not enough? That is the question. And the answer to the question is also a question. The film reinforces the turn from the political to the personal by shifting the tone and scene to the private intimate world of the doomed lovers who have, to, who have recuperated, recuperated a space for themselves amid the chaos of the external world of politics, militants, and occupation. The move further affirms the film's interest from this point on in the personal revenge that Heather seeks, rather than the politically contingent and arrested state of Jammu and Kashmir under occupation. This transition, premised on the plot development of the Shakespearean source, expunges the radical possibilities inherent in that same source. The revenge play, after all, ushers in a new regime at its conclusion. At the end of Heather, however, or the end of Heather, however, fragments that possibility. Eschewing the mandates of genre, patriarchal command, and militancy, preferring instead obeisance to the maternal will to live. While on the surface, that might seem laudable and offer a hopeful escape from the unending cycle of violence. 
and revenge, it simultaneously maintains the status quo in Kashmir, leaving unchanged and marginally challenged the authority of the Indian state. In other words, the film's transmission of political resistance the film's transformation of political resistance into personal revenge upholds the power of the occupier. No matter the level of critique aimed at the Indian state or the sympathy solicited for the persecuted Kashmiri populace, to render the conflict in Kashmir as personal revenge, as a family squabble between brothers, reinscribes resistance within familiar ideologies imposed by the Indian state which configures Jammu and Kashmir as the head of its national political body. The only resistance the film poses to the traditional tropes of Kashmir is its focus on their helplessness and the, and highlighting, and the highlighting of the brutal violence of the Indian army. In other ways, the revenge drama works to destabilize and depo depoliticize Kashmiri resistance. Power remains in the hands of those who do not hesitate to wield it ruthlessly. To settle on, in the end, the notion that the excessive and illegitimate, um, given the occupation and the lack of a plebiscite, force of the occupier can only be met by the disavowal of violence by the occupied does not recognize the fear, anger, humiliation, and degradation of life suffered by the oppressed. It expects only and always for the oppressed to show greater humanity than their oppressors. It offers an illusion of peace and only on the terms dictated by the occupier. I've tried to talk today about Shakespeare and adaptation and race and nation um, through a film that is not as deeply meditative or interior as its source, yet it succeeds in querying the symbolic, affective, and subjective value of nation or imagined community in a locale denied that possibility. To depict Shakespeare's Hamlet through Kashmir is to subordinate the national, global, and imperial figure and work to the ethical, political, and personal conditions of the Kashmir Valley, Valley and its occupied, besieged, and globally ignored status. Shakespeare here functions as a contact zone. The cultural capital and cachet attached to his work um, facilitates Heather's depiction of the brutal reality of Kashmiri existence under Indian occupation. It remains for us to ask what ethical dimension inheres in our inquiry of this object because our critical interest in this film is eclipsed in all ways by the brutal material reality of the lives of the Kashmiri people living under Indian occupation. Our inquiry must also, I believe, contribute in some way to advocating for their freedom, dignity, and humanity. Hamlet asks to be or not to be, to which Heather responds, to be and not to be. Through such reconfigurations, Pardwaj demonstrates the plasticity of Shakespeare in other global, particular, local, indigenous, and national contexts. Pardwaj extends his manipulation of Hamlet to the end by having Heather abstain from murdering his uncle and abandon the bloody spectacle and geography of death that is the graveyard and by extension Indian occupied Kashmir. Yet, as the closing as the closing titles and the ruby blood marring the pristine snow attest, the Indian nation states hold on this geography and the presence of the Indian army endures and Kashmir remains in stasis, trapped by the conjunction of to be and not to be. Thank you. And now I have the pleasure of turning it over to Joyce. Um, thank you. Thanks very, very much. Um, I really would like to thank our two organizers, Emily McLeod and Emily Lathrop, for, um, both for inviting me and for pairing me with Amber Marine. Um, it's, I'm speaking to you here from Louisville, Kentucky, uh, which is uh, Taylor, a young woman the same age as my own daughter, uh, who was taken from us um, under unjust circumstances. Uh, we can't bring her back, but we can make sure that she is remembered properly. And memory is a big part of what my paper is about today. Um, a lot of what I do with Shakespeare is, uh, has involved studying how people remember and reuse him in their own work. 
under circumstances that would also uh, that would often have been unthinkable in his own time. Reaching back to reproduce Shakespeare means crossing gulfs of time in the centuries between his world and our own, and also gulfs of space, um, especially uh, for my purposes, the vastness of the Atlantic, uh, the ocean that English people crossed on their way to becoming Americans, the ocean across which Black Africans were transported on their way to becoming chattel in the New World, uh, in whose depths so many of our ancestors lay drowned. When I started working on the material in this paper, I got, I found myself hung up on an anecdote I found in a book that recorded interviews that Works Project Administration field workers conducted with Black Georgians, uh, the oldest of whom had been born in slavery in the 1930s. These 20th century Black Americans remembered and retold family stories about their African ancestors' attempt to close the gap of time and space so they could go back home. Uh, in 1803, Igbo slaves, newly transported from what's now Nigeria to St. Simon's Island off the coast of Georgia, walked together into the waters of Dunbar Creek and drowned in what was either a deliberate mass suicide or an action undertaken in the belief that they could return home. Throughout small towns in the Georgia Sea Islands, stories of Africans who did find a way to escape bondage and go back home survived into the 1930s, as these slaves' descendants reported that some of their ancestors could either turn themselves into birds or, in fact, flew away in their human bodies. According to Wallace Quarterman, who was born as the property of Roswell King, the manager of the plantation on St. Simon's Island where the Evos walked into the water, the slaves in the plantation who had come directly from Africa were troublesome. No one could understand their language and they either didn't know how or refused to learn how to work the fields. Finally, um, Roswell tells us, they simply decided that they ain't stay down here. One day, when the frustrated overseer was going to whip them, they all down their hoes. Then Roswell King says, they say quack, 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 and they riz up in the sky and turn themselves into buzzards and fly right back to Africa. The grandmother of Rosa Grant from Possum Point had been brought from Africa with her own mother called Teresa when she was just a little girl. Grant remembered how her grandmother, remembered her grandmother Rina telling her how Teresa got to the point where she just couldn't stand her life in America anymore. She wanted to go back to Africa. One day my grand Rina was standing with her in the field. Teresa turned round. She stretched her arms out so and rise straight up and fly right Africa. The myth of flying Africans in Georgia and South Carolina percolated through the decades, finding its imaginative way into Texas different as Lionel Hampton's 1939 swing tune, Flying Home, which in its turn generated uh, Billy Eckstein's second balcony jump, Robert Hayden's 1943 poem, O Daedalus, Fly Away Home, Toni Morrison's 1977 novel, Song of Solomon, documentary, fi documentary filmmaker Sophia Nali Allison's 2019 short, Dreaming Gave Us Wings. All of these works record in their different ways the attempt to close the gap of time and space and to go back home to the beginning. Although um, he wasn't thinking about the logistics of how to deny social death and undo the passage of time. Jacques Derrida reminds us in his essay, Archive Fever, of the difficulty of keeping memory alive in the present. Given that in his etymology of the word archive, it was stewarded in the ancient world by privileged archons or civic magistrates and held under virtual house arrest by state gatekeepers who held a vested interest in what could become known and in how citizens who achieved access could use this knowledge. In his history, to remember is to engage in acts of seizure, invasion, and rebellion. Following him, um, it seems to me that the special difficulties attending memory in the case of enslaved people uh, become obvious. On top of the ways in which state authority guards public memory, people from the same tribe or the same region were separated from each other so that they couldn't understand their new fellow speech or take comfort in the shared national habits that mark community. As well as living in a state of permanent individualized alienation, 
from the places and the living beliefs that had formed them. The problem of imagining how to heal nostalgic loss and return to a time and a place before is perhaps especially acute in representing Black women whose narrations of their own experiences have been so absent from the pre-modern historical record. No one archived your existence, Sophia Nali Allison remarks in her narration for her film Dreaming Gave Us Wings. And so poets and historians have had to learn to find traces of these women's lives in the stories others told about them and in the ways these stories were recorded. Just as Robert Hayden used the classical myth of Daedalus and Icarus as a tool for helping us understand the myth of flying Africans, since his readers were living in that continuing state of cultural alienation and needed help to find their ways home, Carolyn Walker Randall turns to an, uh, Williams Randall turns to another part of the Western canon, Shakespeare's sonnets, in order to reveal the traces of self-generated power left by another one of those lost female black subjects, the woman known as Lucy Negro. Williams' collection, Lucy Negro Redux, uh, was published last year, partly remembers and partly imagines the woman known as Lucy Negro or Black Luce, who is mentioned as a prominent participant in a licentious 1594 Gray's Inn Christmas entertainment, and who G.B. Harrison proposed as Shakespeare's lover and the inspiration for the so-called Dark Lady Sonnets as early as 1933. Her poems were in their turn inspired by the research of contemporary Shakespeare's held into the minutes of London's Bridewell Hospital, which was not a hospital in the modern sense, but rather a combination of court and prison for those arrested and convicted for crimes connected to the city's sex trade. Lucy Negro both is and is not present in the Bridewell Minute books. We don't know where she was born, who her parents were, or how she entered her trade. No records of her arrest, conviction, or imprisonment survive. But other less lucky arrestees do bring her up, uh, perhaps in an effort to deflect some of the state's power away from them. It's clear that Black Luce ran a brothel that moved through various locations in Clerkenwell, <clears throat> northwest of the city. A pander named William Meekins testified that the prostitute Margaret Goldmith lay at Black Luce's at Great While, and Great Company resorted to her, and Black Luce has much gain by keeping of her, and was lewd to her and knew well, knew it well that she was naughty. A prostitute named Elizabeth Kirkman, who worked for the pimp Gilbert East, testified before the court that Black Luce and Gilbert East were partners. They agreed that when Black Luce had any great guest, that either Kirkman or another of these prostitutes should go over to Luce's house to serve the prominent customer. And Luce Bainham, another one of her aliases, should have the one half of the money and East the other half. Kirkman insisted to the court that Black Luce is a vile bawd and liveth by it. The work that Williams, our poet, lay over Salkeld's work, however, while interested in recovering a woman's voice and reorienting the discipline of literary history, sought to do more than just flesh out the words of archival accounts. Following Salkeld's researches, implicit acknowledgement of the presence of Black Africans in Renaissance London, uh, Williams' collection uses the myth of Lucy Negro as a way of writing Black women collectively back into history using the Dark Lady sonnets as her missing archive, as well as to see herself as an historical actor. Lucy Negro Redux flies away home, not back to Africa, but to what Williams imagines as a recoverable moment of a Black woman's presence and power, a moment that offers an anchoring model for the modern woman, who is the poem's eye. Williams' dual project of remembering and recreating a past for Black women begins with a final couplet from Shakespeare's sonnet 132. Then will I swear that beauty herself is black and all they foul that thy complexion lack. To those two lines, Williams adds another of her own. Be brave and steal, Miss Lucy. Lucy Negro is not stealing away home in any literal sense. Uh, she is perfectly at home in the, the underworld of Renaissance London. What she's doing perhaps is working in stealth by night secretly accumulating the raw materials for a life and presence of her own, in her own terms, out of what's available to her. Let me tell you about Black Lucy, the poem Black Lucy Negro Two begins. Lucy run a brothel. Lucy got a lover. Lucy owned her body. 
Black Lucy's claim to her own sexuality, her survival in the Elizabethan archive as a sexual being, speaks to the poem's narrator across time. But the narrator, who both is the Caroline Randall Williams who went to London to meet Duncan Salkeld and read through the surviving volumes of the Bridewell Court books, not is additionally and especially moved by the possibility that the historical Lucy Negro or Black Luce or Luce Bainham is Shakespeare's lover. We know that she Lucy Negro and some of the prostitutes she ran were invited to perform at the Christmas Revels put on by Gray's Inn on the Feast of the Innocents, December 28, 1594. As Je Jester Grayorum, the mock chronicle of these holiday festivities has it, Lucy Negro, Abbess de Clerkenwell, held her title by night service to the Prince of Purple, the imaginary patron of the law school, and was charged to find a choir of nuns with burning lamps to chant placebo to the gentlemen of the Prince's privy chamber. Justa Gregorum des describes a night that got so out of hand that the planned entertainment devolved into a disordered tumult and crowd upon the stage with audience members leaving their places to join Lucy's nuns. Another part of the entertainment that night was a play called A Comedy of Errors, which from its description was probably Shakespeare's The Comedy of Errors. But the account of the evening's festivities doesn't mention Shakespeare's name as it does Lucy Negro's. While he certainly could have been there, as a young playwright eager for the kind of recognition a successful holiday performance for a well-connected crowd could have brought him, there's no absolute evidence that he was. This absence of absolute proof one way or the other enables William's invention. As she writes in one of her narrative interjections in the book, in August of 2012, I got it into my head that Shakespeare had a black lover and that this woman was the subject of sonnets 127 through 154. She notes that the only one of the Bridewell Minute books that did not survive London's Great Fire of 1666 was the volume covering 1579 to 1597, which would have included any arrests or prosecutions arising from that wild night at Gray's Inn. As the fire raged, people inside the hospital are supposed to have thrown the books down to barges on the Thames below to save the history they contained. But, uh, Williams writes that one volume missed its mark and lies from that day to this at the bottom of the river. In London, to read the remaining record books, Williams works to fill in the lost historical record. Um, this is from the poem Black Loose, uh, which is on page 19, and I think that you'll, you'll have access to it. Um, I'm only going to read a little bit of it. Uh, my exiat saith that if Black Luce, alias Luce Bainham, alias Lucy Negro, alias Lewis East, might have been Shakespeare's dark lady, then she is indeed the dark lady and is me also. My exiat saith that I will dig and root about and trawl and query and wildly surmise until there is a place for you, Lucy. And it will be my place for having carved yours out and altogether earned by you for us and proved by me for us. And so this is the poem that includes um, a table. Um, the poem renders its findings as a table as to um, invest her reconstructed, wildly surmised history with a certain kind of technical vigor. Her newly excavated line of historical descent flows from Shakespeare's sonnet 131 through a phrase from Conrad's Heart of Darkness that identifies London, the imperial center, as one of the dark places of the earth. Her black wires are where the world began, Williams writes, echoing sonnet 130's rejection of a Petrarchan vocabulary for women's beauty, if hair be wires and black wires grow in her head. Conrad's dark heart of empire becomes the dark space between Lucy Negro's legs, adorned with textured black pubic hair. Shakespeareans have observed that even though Shakespeare's characters spend a lot of time talking about black people and about blackness, very few black people actually appear on stage in his plays. That's one of the things that make, makes the Dark Lady sonnet so compelling. They obsess over the speaker's obsessive love for a woman who is clearly not white. Then will I swear that beauty herself is black and all they foul with thy complexion lack. 
Linda Boos has persuasively argued that the scarce representation of Black women in particular speaks to the period's sexual and racial anxieties. Bill, she builds on Janet Adelman's psychological reading of this scarcity by asserting that it is in the person of the Black woman that the culture's pre-existing fears, both about the female sex and about gender dominance, are realized. Through her, all free-floating anxieties about the mother's dark place contaminating the, fa contaminating the father's designs for perfect self-replication become vividly literal. In the all-important arena of reproductive authority, Black women, Booth writes, control the power to resignify all offspring as the property of the mother. Where I have to disagree with Booth's claims is uh, about the implications of this representational lack is with the notion of Black women's reproductive authority. By the end of the 17th century, Britain's North American colonies had begun to enact laws that did indeed signify Black women's offspring as their mother's children only. But these laws were aimed at legally denying white men's legal, respons legal responsibility for the children that Black women, many of whom by this point were enslaved, bore them. In the legal and social practices of slave culture, Black women were able to exercise virtually no authority over their children's lives or their own. Although their sexual and reproductive labor sustained slavery's distorted domestic intimacies, their stories remain unvoiced. No life stories told by a female survivor of the Middle Passage exist. Thinking of the women who lived and died in slavery without being able to record their own stories, this idea Hartman wonders how we as descendants and survivors can produce a kind of counter history of those lost lives without merely reiterating violent speech and depicting again rituals of torture. As she rediscovered the traces of Lucy Negro that Duncan Selkeld outlined in his study of the Bridewell Minute books, and as she reread the Dark Lady sonnets in light of her imagined presence, Williams finds an opportunity to speak with and through one of these lost female ancestors and to tell a different story. Through her presence in Shakespeare's sonnets and through the poets claiming her as an historical ancestor, the poem Black Luce finally declares that Lucy Negro is a seat at the table. Lines and phrases from nearly a dozen of the sonnets, mar sonnets mark Williams' collection. It's made in light of Shakespeare's. But Lucy Negro Redux is equally animated by its liberating lack of a critical or creative archive. For Williams, the gap in the Bridewell Minute book's evidence of Lucy Negro's presence becomes an invitation to freely imagine how she might fit into the historical record. One poem from volume four of the Bridewell Prison Records, London, 1579 to 1597, records exeats referring to a scandalous triangle between Black Luce, a lawyer named William Hatcliffe, and a man named William Shakespeare. The historical William Hatcliffe played the Prince of Purple at the 1594 Gray's Inn Christmas celebrations and was advanced by Shakespeare's biographer, Leslie Hodson, as the mysterious Mr. W.H., to whom the 1609 first edition of the sonnets is dedicated. William Shakespeare gets into a great disturbance with a lawyer from Gray's Inn in the street in front of Black Luce's house, apparently because he thought the lawyer was visiting Luce too often. The entries end with Hatcliffe's accusation that William Shakespeare performed lewd acts on her in the Curtain Playhouse, and that while she left the playhouse singing, Mr. Shakespeare never came again to the stage that night. William does not invent the William Hatcliffe, Lucy Negro, William Shakespeare love triangle out of whole cloth. Rather, she remembers the unproven possibility that it actually happened differently than Leslie Hodson remembers it. At the time that Hudson argued for Hatcliffe's relationship to Shakespeare, he was also convinced there had been no connection between Shakespeare and Lucy Negro, who had first been tentatively advanced as the Dark Lady again in 1933. Harrison, Hudson writes, had done Shakespeare the discredit of believing his fair enslaver a blackamoor. Under so dark a misapprehension, he writes, the tentativeness of Harrison's identification was commendable, and he followed his negress no further. 
While both Williams and Hudson might be accused of writing the kind of Shakespeare fan fiction that foregrounds autobiographical readings of the sonnets, Williams freely entertains an aspect of the possible stories that Hudson firmly denies. In the collection's first section of poems, recovering Lucy Negro's presence works to generate the, pre the poet's own sense of her standing as an authoritative Black female speaker in the modern world. Black Lucy Negro III begins, Lucy Negro, I am you. Lucy Negro, you can become anything, I say. This claiming of a Black woman standing a uh, claim she can only make through her determined creative labors over historical records that are only partially present, extends more uncertainly to the speaker's claiming of her own beauty and sexuality. Part of what these poems speaker is unquestionably drawn to in Lucy Negro is what the existing records portray as her successful commandeering of a sexual economy in which women were designated objects for men's consumption. In the collection's sec second section, however, the poem's historical awareness moves beyond William's role as creator, working to conjure what has been hidden into full sight, or beyond the speaker's identification with Lucy Negro's brazen self-possession, as they begin to engage with the sexual places Black women occupied in an early modern history of slavery. In the poem Field Holler, for instance, the bag for harvesting picked cotton becomes a whitish exclamation mark pointing back to the house baby girl, the anchor to this earth, this house, the accidental crop, the unwanted harvest yield. The long white cotton bag here becomes the road backwards to the past, pointing to the master's house as the place of origin for black women's presence in the moral and sexual economies of slavery. Uh, here I urge you to read William's June essay in the New York Times on her own racial identity and on her descent from Alabama segregationist Edmund Pettus. This open yet secret history of white men forcing sex on black women in slavery and the unacknowledged biracial babies such rapes produced are a constant presence in this section of Lucy Negro Redux. While the two, 2019 ballet that Paul Vasterling choreographed around William's poems includes several poems from the collection fully theatrically delivered on stage by Williams herself, this part of the collection was instead represented by Rhiannon Giddens' live performance of her song at the purchaser's option from her 2017 album, Freedom Highway. The song's title comes from a phrase in an 1822 notice advertising a young Negro wench for sale in New York's Hudson Valley. She was used to both house and field work, the notice said, and she also had a nine-month-old baby who could be included in the sale or not at the purchaser's option. The song speaker is that young mother facing the possibility of separation from her baby, who was probably the result of rape by the man who owned her. I've got a body dark and strong. I was young, but not for long. You took me to bed a little girl, left me in a woman's world. Giddens sang as accompaniment to a solo by dancer Kayla Rouser, who played Lucy, providing a backstory that's missing from the Bridewell Minute books. In one way, of course, the cruel story Giddens' song tells is not applicable to who the historical Lucy could have been. Lucy Negro disappears from the historical record in the early 17th century, long before the slave trade was fully established with North America. And whatever her place of origin was, it was not likely to have been the Americans. But the sexual exploitation and profanation of motherhood that Williams' poem and Giddens' song take from a history of Black women in the Americas, however, is not the end of the story that Lucy Negro Redux wants to tell. Um, the two Emilies might be linking you to the poem, um, Knowing, what is it called? Knowing Thy Heart um, on this page. So I urge you to have a look at that. The fascinating new book by historian Jessica Marie Johnson, Wicked Flesh, Black Women, Intimacy and Freedom in the Atlantic World, points to how free Black women across the Atlantic fashioned and struggled to maintain their own networks of kinship and intimacy in the shadow of slavery, and indeed used what she calls erotic entanglements as ways of practicing freedom. Williams is a poet and not an historian, but her argument in Lucy Negro redux is much the same. Far from being ashamed about the way she makes her living, her Lucy's last testimony acknowledges that I am wild and that I live by it and I like it, like the money 
and the witness and the grotesque and the yes, yes. She stands as the ancestor of the bereft young woman we see in At the Purchaser's Option, sexual agent as well as sexual object, and sometimes unable to distinguish between the two, as in her own uneven sonnet um, that um, I'm not going to read here because the, it's too hard to keep the two parts of the poem together. Uh, Williams Lucy Negro stands as the result of her triumphant imaginary excavation, an avatar of her translation of Black women's sexual abjection into erotic authority. The first time we see her before G.B. Harrison's reticent suggestion or Leslie Hodson's indignant denial or Duncan Salkel's historically minded recovery or Williams' rememory, the first time we see her, we see Lucy Negro dancing entering the historical record and our historical memory, such as it is, in motion, inviting reaction to this early, perhaps very first record of Black women in Renaissance performance. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so. So Joyce, I, Oh, I see some other, Maria has joined us. Um, I know that the Emily's wanted us to think about our papers and, and points where they align. And for me right now, um, I was taking notes furiously as I was reading earlier and more as you were, um, as you were speaking. And I was really think, struck by when you talk about remembering, because it's not just you're talking about memory, but also kind of remaking a body, right? Like remembering in, uh, in a way. And I see that happening in both of our papers where we're trying to remember something that is, um, for my text, I think a not very successful uh, attempt to um, restore to Kashmir a, a kind of loss. Um, but certainly in your text, I see it m much more powerfully being articulated. Yeah, um, I think you're exactly right there. Um, I'm thinking, of course, of Tony Tony Morrison's use of of the term rememory, um, and to me, to to dismember a body is to take it apart, but to remember is to put it back together. Um, to, to reach across time and space and to reassemble it, maybe not the way it was, but the way it should have been, the way it would have been if it had been left alone. And so bodies and, and bodily intimacies and the family space that you describe in your paper seem to be a point of connection for, um, for both, um, both of the papers and sort of um, the ways in which both of us were thinking about how making Shakespeare over has to go through the flesh or through uh, these kinship, physical connections that we have to each other. Yeah, and I was also thinking oh, about, left. about how, you know, the, the, the place of Shakespeare in both of our papers is very tangential, right? I mean, it's, it's there, mm -hmm. he's important, he is a touchstone for, uh, the the kind of global north western eurocentric culture in which we live um, and and yet that body like what I love about uh, your paper is that that body isn't allowed to stand in judgment or stand by itself as the authority and and Lucy has this voice and and the line you cited which I paraphrase re really poorly. Uh, from the poem about Lucy, uh, Lucy owning her own body, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 that kind of ownership of her own body through Shakespeare for the writer, I think for me was really um, it it opened up lots of questions about like why why Shakespeare? That's what I struggle with constantly. Like why do I need Shakespeare to do this work? Why can't I just do this work without Shakespeare? Well, what was really funny when I was first reading in, in Gesta, Gesta Graeorum, where I work for as a big part of the hired entertainment at the Fee, the Innocent Celebration at Gray's Inn, um, they mention her name 
you know, and they go into all kinds of detail about her. And they mentioned the title of the play that was um, probably the Comedy of Errors, you know, the Comedy of Errors. But what they don't mention is Shakespeare's name. You know, I like I say, I can imagine he was there. This was a an audience of well-connected, you know, rich young men. But whoever wrote this story down didn't think that his name was worth recording. They did, however, want to, to write down this, this sort of celebrity madam's name, which, which I think is really, it speaks pretty directly. Is Shakespeare central? They weren't so sure about their, their function, about Shakespeare's function that night in 1594. So, I mean, that, that's what jumped out at me right away. Yeah. So I wonder if we can turn it over to any questions that the audience might have. Yeah, sure. absolutely. So I have a question here and please, um, we have some time, we have till 4.30. So please audience members feel free to, um, to type, type away your questions. So my first question is, um, regarding adaptation and teaching, as this is a lecture that's geared, you know, towards our undergraduates and we really, you know, prize our, our undergraduate English department community at GW. Um, when you are teaching Shakespeare and especially teaching Shakespeare and adaptation potentially together, what is your goal that you want undergraduates to take away um, when when you put Shakespeare's work alongside works like Heather or or Lucy Negro Redux, um, what what uh, do you want undergraduates to take away from kind of those combinations of material? Um, I'm, I'm happy to start. I, I I want them to think. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> sure. Okay. Um, I uh, yeah. I really think that um, what, what I tell them is that we're reading Shakespeare and then we're watching these adaptations, not as like, oh, look what these other people can do with Shakespeare, but like how, certainly that's a part of it, but how does this response, right? How does Heather open up a new way for you to think about Hamlet? That for me, like, so I really need it to be uh, a kind of dialogic engagement and not just here is this thing called Shakespeare and here are all these people who adore him so much and then they adapt it and sort of um, try to put their own stamp on it. I really want them to think about both of these things standing um, equally and talking to each other rather than a kind of unidirectional conversation. Mm -hmm. Something like Hamlet or Romeo and Juliet is so familiar that students often kind of don't really pay active attention to it in, anymore. And so sh teaching that play in, in conjunction with um, an adapted version of it, I really like using um, the Kurosawa film, Bad, The Bad Sleep Well, which okay. is like, you know, a, a film noir. Yeah. Hamlet. Um, it, it sort of shocks them awake it makes them pay new attention to features of the Shakespeare text that they may have, that they may have overlooked, like Nishi in the, the Kurosawa film. This is a dude whose, his whole life has been taken up with thinking about his father, mm -hmm. who in some ways wasn't even really his father, didn't claim it. Mm -hmm. you know, so what does that tell us when we go back to Hamlet about those kinds of, of tense, mixed up family relationships there? It just makes us think more consciously, is, is what I think. Wonderful. Thank you for that. So we have some more questions coming in. Uh, so Professor Frawley, actually, our chair, has asked um, if Joyce's theory about reassembly works in, tam in tandem with the possibilities of literary or filmic adaptation. So if either of you would like to answer that. Reassemble. Yeah, yeah, I think definitely so. I mean, going back to whatever is intractable or where you, you can't find at your way into that Shakespeare text. So many adapters kind of go back to it and confront that intractability to, to take it apart, 
and make it over. Uh, make it into something that feels more amenable. Make it into something that speaks more than for them. Make it into something that perhaps maybe addresses those issues that makes it seem, um, you know, so resistant. So I mean, um, there's 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 tons of of films and also I think dramatic responses to the Shakespeare text that that work on precisely this notion of taking it apart mm -hmm. and and putting it back together so we can look at those bones that that underlay it. I'm thinking of. Um, Garcia Lorca's play El Publico, for instance, as a really sort of Dada Romeo and Juliet, you know, a sur surrealist Romeo and Juliet in some, some respects. But he has to take it apart before he can get to what seems essential about it. And I'm sure Amberine has other examples. I think what's um, for me really interesting, at, at, like teaching, um, thinking through teaching these kinds of adaptations is that students always want to know, well, if they do all of these things, like the Bad Sleep Well, for example, they're, they're always like, well, is this Hamlet? Because like the recognizable bones of the story are, it, it's, it's so much more shadowy than Heather. Heather is very recognizable. The Bad Sleep Well, like by the end, you're like, okay, I get, <laughs> I get how this is. Um, uh, and so, and so their question becomes, well, like, then where is Shakespeare? And that for me is, are, is this interesting moment because that's putting, like putting it on them, like what their expectation is of Shakespeare mm -hmm. and, and how much we are allowed to play with Shakespeare, right? So authority, agency, power, all of these questions can be opened up by this kind of reassembly. Okay, really interesting. Um, so I have a question um, from audience member Jay, um, who is asking um, Ambreen specifically uh, about Heather. Um, he writes, Gazala is so much more interesting than Gertrude. She's given more agency and is far more consequential than her Shakespearean counterpart. How do you think she works within the war, ter war terror culture Heather depicts? Yeah, um, I mean, I think uh, Gazala's role is so, uh, for me, also more fascinating simply because it's very rare that you see um, Muslim women uh, <laughs> depicted in a way that is kind of positive and heroic. Uh, and yet there's still this problem of, um, in trying to free her son, she has to violate all of the principles that she herself holds dear regarding the terroristic violence of the place in which she's trapped right and so she she gives in to she makes a deal with the terrorists and by that point in the film that's all we're supposed to think of the militants as terrorists and she literally has to put on a suicide vest to um, destroy herself and, and obviously Kurram so that she can free her son, right? And yes, that obviously gives her a lot of complexity, but it also plays into lots of ways in which th thinking from um, like the Algerian revolution onwards where Muslim women in like burqas or jadars or, or whatever covering they had were accused of, of possibly smuggling terroristic weapons into spaces. Um, and not to say that that strategy wasn't utilized, but that this is an idiot. This is like, you know, this is not a new thing that is being invented. This is the stereotype that is being recirculated in this new way. So it, it's very much part of how Muslim women are being depicted also in this kind of entertainment. So those are all of the questions that have been sent in. If anyone um, has something else they'd like to ask, please send it in to us. But otherwise, we've come to the conclusion of our Q&A. Emily, do you have anything to add? Um, I just wanted to note, you know, we've, we have such an amazing array of people who've joined us today from Shakespeare scholars all over the country and maybe out, outside of this country as well. Um, undergraduates and um, and grad students too like we had a great message from 
the GW um, School of uh, Classical Acting MFA program that um, tuned in as part of their class. Um, so we're just so excited to, that we were able to um, make these talks accessible to so many people. Um, it's definitely a silver lining of, of the current situation that we're in. Um, and we are so, so grateful for these um, inspiring and moving um, talks that we've heard today. Um, and yeah, it, it looks like, you know, we're ready to wrap up if, if uh, Professor Frawley wants to say anything else in conclusion. Well, I'll just echo what you two have already said and thank both Joyce and Amber Dean. Um, those were fabulous papers. Um, I saw one comment, brilliant papers in the chat. And to me, it's your modeling so well for our students um, how to make scholarship that really matters in the world, um, to make people think about their worlds now and think about worlds long ago. So I really appreciate um, your papers from a role modeling standpoint as well. Uh, so thank you everybody. And um, thanks again to Emily Lathrop and Emily McLeod for pu pulling this fabulous event off. So stay well, everybody. And I really enjoyed meeting Joyce and Amardeen. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for having us. I, I do have a quick thing to say to our panelists, if they could stick around. But we'll end um, the, record, the Facebook recording now. OK. What's up? <laughs> Uh, so I just wanted to, uh, I'm getting messages from Caroline Randall Williams on Facebook, um, who is asking if she can get a link to the Zoom to say hi. Um, so can Emily, how, do, how would that work? Can I send her the link? Yes. Okay. The link, it should still, still let her in. Is it still working? Sure. Okay. Let me see if we can get this to work. Uh, okay. I can also invite her from from here as well. It doesn't matter. Okay, I just met, I just messaged it to her. That's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty wild. Um, I was talking, I got an email from Scott Neustadt at Rhodes College in Memphis today, and they were having, she was giving some kind of Zoom lecture there today, and he had noted, um, you know, uh, the, the announcement of this event and that, you know, my paper was going to be talking about her. And, you know, he, he mentioned it, he mentioned it to her and it's just like, you know, so it's, it's nice to hear back from her. Do you see anything, Emily? Yes. Yes. Let me, I'm going to make I see, I see Caroline Williams. There she is. There she is. She should be allowed to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Oh, yeah. Here you are. Wait, I don't I know if you remember me or not. What's that? It's, yeah, I don't know if you remember me from in Nashville back last yeah. February yeah. of uh, 2019. Yeah, of course. Yeah. It's so yeah. great to see you. <laughs> a small world. It's crazy. I know. Well, I was, I gave a talk at Rhodes this morning, at Rhodes, at, mm -hmm. on Zoom at Rhodes yeah. this morning. And, um, oh, for heaven's sake, the, the brilliant gentleman's name is escaping Scott, me. Scott, Scott, thank you, yeah. thank you, Scott. Uh, Scott was like, just so you know, there's a really cool thing happening after this talk. <laughs> I was like, oh, fun. <laughs> so I just, uh, I just snuck on and I wanted to say thank you. I've had to go. I have a, Another Zoom call at 4.30 and I had to go redo my makeup because I was crying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very, I'm, I'm humbled and grateful for your work. 
um, in both of you, I wrote down, um, uh, I wrote down, uh, 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 Amberine, is that how I, is that, do you, can we first name? I wrote down what you said Just about the Amberine. <laughs> oh, <but that laughs> I um I wrote down what you said about the oppressed always having to be held to a higher moral standard than the oppressor. I mean, it's sort of the paradox of tolerance, right? It's like so mm -hmm. exhausting. Um, but I was really moved by that. But you guys, like, thank you. I just wanted to say hi. I just so exciting, so exciting to hear people thinking about the things that I that we all love so much in space and the apocalypse. Um, <laughs> Oh, and also, I did have a thought for just to put in the basket about. Thank you for showing up. Oh, are you kidding? Go. Oh, wait, everyone's frozen. Are we frozen? No, we're no it's okay. Oh, cool. Um, and then my last thought one, I love the fact that you pointed out that they never mentioned Shakespeare's name at the Justa Graeorum mm -hmm. on that night. Like, love that. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, um, the question of why Shakespeare for like celebrating our own bodies. My answer to that question has always been about, uh, you know, it's just a practical necessity that like black and brown bodies are in danger in white space um, because, of, you know, because, because of all of the systems in place that you guys addressed. And I think that part of the way that erasure happens is that they, think that we don't belong here and that we haven't been here and you know why Shakespeare for the lens it's like well are you gonna tell me that blackness is not beautiful when Shakespeare said so you know like it 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 it, it, it strips present whiteness of its perceived authority because he is such a um a certain arbiter of a certain kind of western aesthetic and taste and power and so when you go back into that document and you say, no, 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 I'm here, <laughs> I'm here already, and validated, right? That, it, it, I, it's more in service to, um, it's a shield in a way, maybe, or a talisman, I don't know, it's something like that. It's a, it's a block against a certain kind of present false white authority. Um, because they have, because they did the work, they made him. You know, Hudson and, and you know, like he he made him that special. Like he he like Hudson did all the work to like for, to give us the room to dismantle his ideas, right? Because he was like Shakespeare's this authority and he's so valuable and brilliant. And then we're like, but you're just a lazy excavator. And like read, tell me that Aaron the Moor is not profoundly human and sympathetic. Like tell me you know, tell me that Shylock is not rendered in a fully like othered and realized way. Like, tell me like, like you're just lazy and you didn't get it because that's the limitation of your mind. But Shakespeare in his infinite variety has allowed us this space looking back, right? Anyway, I just am like, but they can't have anything. Like they don't know, white, people, white men do not get to take anything else from us. Like, no, 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 no. <laughs> anyway, sorry, but you guys are- oh, We can't have everything. <laughs> do you mind if I take a screenshot before you have to go to your 4.30? Just Are you kidding? I, my 4.30 is in an hour. I'm in Tennessee. But yes. Oh, great. <laughs> I just wanted to say that. I'm so happy. <laughs> Thank you so much for showing up. Unexpected surprise at the end. You guys are amazing. I'm so, ex I'm so happy that it's happened. <laughs> Amberine, where is your time zone again? She's in Pacific. She's in... Okay. She's in California. California. Okay, California. So I was okay. trying to figure, yes. <laughs> Three right, guys, I'm going to go away. I don't want to, I didn't mean to gate crash. I just was no, not at all. Hand girling. Yeah. The amazing Thank you so much. <laughs> Please, so nice. Please be in touch. Bye, you guys. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye. Bye. All righty. What a cool surprise. Oh, yeah. Sweet. And we have it recorded because it's still recording. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank you both so much it's thank you. Uh, such an honor really we're so so grateful and so happy